Hi everyone, I'm Amanda Kalmus and I will share a little bit about the Intensive Early Active Treatment or I EAT pilot study of feeding therapy for babies at risk of cerebral palsy. So Lauren was looking at young adults and we're shifting all the way down to newborns under 12 months. And this study forms part of my PhD. So as Lauren spoke about, a successful and safe swallow is a very complex motor task. It actually requires coordination of 31 pairs of muscles. So it's not surprising that people with cerebral palsy who have trouble controlling their muscles commonly present with oropharyngeal dysphagia or difficulties with eating, drinking and swallowing. And dysphagia increases the risk of aspiration pneumonia caused by food and fluid entering the lungs and is a leading cause of death of people, uh, in people who have CP. Muscle and bone development in people with cerebral palsy are already impaired, but then you add in sufficient nutrition that inevitably comes from dysphagia, which further impairs this as well as their growth, their cognition, their general health and their immunity. And about 30% of children with bilateral CP way below the third percentile. And that's comparable to what we see in Ethiopia and India. And 75% of children with feeding difficulties at six months of age are also underweight at six years, uh, sorry, at eight years of age. And dysphagia is present across the whole range of GMFCS levels in children. Uh, so not only in the most severe GMFCS GMFCS levels four and five, where Kath Benfer found that 100% of preschoolers showed signs of dysphagia, but also in the, the milder end of the spectrum, GMFCS levels one and two, 70 to 82.4% of these preschool children showed signs of dysphagia. So what can we do or what do we do to help these kids? Well, the safest way to support nutrition and minimise the risk of aspiration is tube feeding, but that limits the child's exposure to oral feeding and there are potential adverse impacts of reducing or delaying exposure to that oral feeding because it reduces a child's opportunity to practice and develop and improve those motor skills. And this is of particular concern with babies, particularly preterm babies and high risk term infants who commonly um, have prolonged tube feeding from birth. So never have the opportunity outside of saliva management to practice those eating and drinking and swallowing skills. So do we know the best way to improve feeding and swallowing in infants with CP? Well, much research is emerging on the use of motor learning interventions in infants with or at high risk of cerebral palsy. And we have really promising results in fine motor skills and gross motor skills in infants with CP. And from an oral motor perspective, uh, we've also seen effective, sorry, but we've also seen a positive effect of motor learning principles in dysphagia in adults who've had a stroke, as Lauren mentioned and in suck coordination for preterm babies and also apraxia of speech in children and children with CP, new, new research that's coming out. Uh, but feeding interventions really can be grouped into three categories. You have direct interventions. They practice oral motor skills using uh, during functional task and use food or fluid to stimulate swallowing. Indirect interventions, which also practice oral motor skills, but outside of that functional task. So they don't use any food or fluid and therefore don't stimulate swallowing. And then you have compensatory strategies that focus on compensa compensating for impairments by simplifying the task, adding support or modifying the environment to achieve success and optimize safety. Motor learning and neuroplasticity research suggests that overusing compensation compensation strategies, or avoiding, oh, oh, sorry, <laughs> avoiding or limiting oral feeding, as is common with tube-fed infants, may inadvertently worsen the impairment of eating and drinking. So you know, use it or lose it. And this is a video showing uh, some examples of feeding treatment. So these are some oral sensory motor exercises that we would call indirect treatment because no food or fluid is used. And they aim to improve suck coordination and latching onto the nipple. These are some compensation strategies with adaptive positioning with those rolled up towels to provide better stability. 
and trunk and head control. So I'm just going to move that. Um, this is a direct therapy because the, the thin tube on the side of this baby's mouth is attached to a bottle of milk that he gets a little bit of as he sucks. And then you have another direct therapy which aims to improve tongue lateralization. You can see mum here using compensatory strategies with external jaw and chin supports. And then some more direct therapy using a mesh feeding bag where the child gets to practice that chewing food, but limiting their risk of choking. So we conducted an international survey of practice open up to speech pathologists who provide services to people with dysphagia. And many of the 280 speech pathologists are using interventions based on motor learning principles. So those direct and in indirect interventions, which is great, but they're not using them with many people on their caseload. And compensation is by far and away the most prevalent intervention that speech pathologists are using. And it makes sense because of the serious consequences of dysphagia. Compensatory strategies often immediately improve feeding safety and reduce the symptoms and risks. But compensation is not treatment. It doesn't target skill development specifically. It changes or modifies the task. And motor learning theory tells us that practicing one task won't lead to improvements in another task, just like blowing bubbles won't improve speech or tapping your foot on the floor won't improve your walking. So we were asking ourselves, what would happen if we ch challenge the swallow? So we're conducting a pilot randomized control trial for infants term age to 12 months corrected age with or at risk of cerebral palsy who have dysphagia that consume at least 20% of their nutrition orally. And we're comparing our intensive early active treatment or I eat with standard care over 12 weeks of therapy. And our research questions are, do parents of infants with CP that have dysphagia deem the I eat program and standard care to be feasible and acceptable interventions? And we're also looking at whether the I eat program is a promising alternative intervention to standard care for improving oral feeding in infants diagnosed with CP and dysphagia. So we've translated those motor learning principles from adult dysphagia literature that Lauren also discussed to try and safely target feeding skills for infants with cerebral palsy. And it's been a real challenge because a lot of that adult literature requires the ability to follow complex instructions. And the pediatric literature focuses on non-nutritive tasks like exercises with a pacifier or chewy tubes that don't fit with that principle of specificity and don't stimulate swallowing. So the principles of motor learning relating to feeding for infants are repetition. So starting really early, under 12 months, and practice those skills as often as possible. You want the practice to be functional, as close to the meal task as possible. So those direct interventions that involve food and fluid and swallowing, obviously while closely monitoring safety. And you want it to be that just right challenge. So not too hard, not too easy just right. So simplification, compensatory strategies can be really helpful here, but those skills need to be reassessed frequently and compensation titrated down as soon and as quickly as possible. You want to try and generalize those skills to real meal times as soon as you can and practice skills during many snacks throughout the day with one food and then maybe transitioning to another food in one environment and then generalizing to other environments and different foods as quick again as you can. And then you need incentive, the kids, right? They need to be attending. They need to be enjoying their meal, especially if they're tube feeders or have had lots of noxious stimuli with hospitalizations in the past. You want it to be fun, child-led and play-based and you want them to be with their family to, during these practice sessions and meals. So in the I eat group, we have infants zero to 12 months of age with or a high risk of CP plus dysphagia, and they are receiving four weeks, sorry, four twice weekly home visits, followed by eight weekly home visits at the infant's home, obviously. 
and we're working on skills and recommendations being reviewed at each visit so we can titrate down those compensatory strategies and increase that challenge as quickly as we can. They've got 15 minute stack challenges three times a day. So they're getting lots of practice and then three main meals to generalize those skills when they've mastered them. And then those demands are progressively increased. And from our survey, we found that standard care is generally seeing the infant once every two to three months in a hospital clinic or outpatient clinic. And the interventions recommended tend to be compensatory strategies. So the children in, in our I Eat study would receive whatever standard care their speech pathologist will prescribe, but this is just an example of what the uh, general standard care is for, for these um, kids. And our primary outcomes are trying to determine whether the uh, both interventions are feasible and acceptable. So uh, we've asked questionnaires to determine that um, and also looking at family stress. So we've calculated their oral intake during and duration of meals and the need for compensatory strategies and monitoring their chest health and their growth. And then objective measures of feeding skills really don't exist at present. So we've searched for a new outcome measure that's more objective than the non-standardized clinical evaluations that actually people are not using that often. Uh, and we, uh, the, and what clinicians tend to do are based on their own clinical knowledge. So outside of video fluoroscopy, which isn't feasible to repeat in the short 12 weeks of the intervention program because of radiation exposure, we had chosen fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing or FEES, um, which is the only other instrumental assessment that's available. But unfortunately, because of the COVID pandemic and the droplet risks of using FEES and nasendoscopy, um, we've had to seize that part of the study. And we've developed an assessment protocol and gone through um, training of using ultrasound as a possible option for visualization of the larynx and the vocal for uh, the vocal cords. And it hasn't been used before, um, but we are in the process of examining whether we can compare ultrasound simultaneously with video fluoroscopy. And so far, we're actually seeing quite promising results. So it's, it's exciting. Um, in the small anatomy of children, I think we'll have more success than we might in adults. Um, but uh, these, are, these are interventions that, uh, sorry, assessments that we're exploring. Okay. And we're just about to close the recruitment uh, for the I8 study. So we're not yet at the point of analyzing the data, the data, but the preliminary results are already supporting our hypotheses, which are that parents receiving the I8 program are reporting an improvement of um, their, their feeding impact swallowing survey, which is the measure of family stress during meals. The infants, uh, in the I8 program are consuming more, they're relying on compensatory strategies less, the meal times um, are, are shorter, and they're um, no worse on their growth trajectory and incidence of aspiration or pneumonia or related hospitalizations. They're all very promising results, but there is a lot more to come. So keep your eyes and ears peeled. And I would like to extend a huge thank you to my super supervisors, Iona Novak, Kathy Morgan and Nadi Badawi, University of Sydney, CP Alliance, Children's Hospital at Westmead, uh, and of course, CP Achieve. And if you've got any questions about today or if any of other CP Achieve uh, webinars or information sessions, you can email them at cp-achieve at mcri.edu.au. Thanks a lot.